Avery. We're thankful for his good heart. We're thankful for his friendship. Father, we are struggling in this hour as we think about our own loss and the emptiness that's in our own lives. And Father, we know that you have taken good care of him. And we pray that you'll take care of us on this day as we as we think about him, reflect on our relationship with him. And Father, all the, the precious and good memories that we have of him. And we're grateful that we have them and that they can live on in our hearts. And we know uh, that uh, as long as we keep Mr. Avery in our hearts and our minds, our memories, uh, that he'll live on with us. And we're thankful for that. And we are thankful for, uh, again, for your love and your care for him and for all of us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Donald Avery, Hamilton, Alabama, born September the 4th, 1949, passed from this life on December the 21st, 2018, at the age of 69, passed away at the Marion Region Regional Nursing Home. He is survived by one sister, Martha Scruggs of Tupelo, Mississippi, Mr. Ross Feltman, his wife Margaret Hamilton, a niece, Jennifer Scruggs, 
host of friends, and particularly the wonderful staff at the Marion Regional Nursing Home in Hamilton. I'm glad there's three verses on that song. Maybe I can get it together. <clears throat> get us finished up in a good way today. A good friend, fellow gospel preacher, and cousin, Ted Burleson is here. And Ted was going to be my backup in case it wasn't going to work out for me to, to do this service. Teddy and I have worked together for a number of years. And, and uh, one of the things that he and I have discussed on more than one occasion, because it seems like a lot of our work together surrounds funerals, and with him being from the Burleson community and you know so many people in common, and one thing that he and I have both discussed and uh, have discussed together and and, uh, and agree on is that, uh, that that we don't get our feelings hurt if somebody doesn't ask us to do a wedding or a funeral. Uh, believe it or not, there are some preachers that do. If you don't ask them to have a part, they get their feelings hurt. I, Teddy and I are not, we're not those guys. But I'm going to tell you, I wanted to preach this funeral. 
I wanted to preach this funeral. Um, not because of me, um, or not just because of my relationship uh, to Mr. Avery, uh, but because of my relationship with him and so many of the nursing home staff that also know him so well. I tell you this as well, I never wear a bow tie at a funeral, ever. Uh, I walked in to the coffee buzz one time and, and uh, I was wearing a long tie because I had just come back from a funeral and the, the ladies asked me, said, where is your bow tie? And I said, I don't wear a bow tie to a funeral because it seems too festive. So I wear a necktie to, to most funerals, but today I make an exception. Two reasons. Number one, I think Mr. Avery would approve of this tie. And number two, every time we would come to the nursing home for our first Sunday singing, the Burleson Church, I would come in with my bow tie, and the very first thing, as we come through the doors, Mr. Avery would look at me and say, let me straighten that tie there, big boy. <laughs> and he'd straighten my tie, and I'd say, do I look presentable now? And he'd say yes, and I'd say, are you going to come down to singing? He said no, <laughs> and he never did. <laughs> Anyone who knows about my relationship with Mr. Avery understands the irony of me holding this service. For about a year or so now, I don't know how long it's been, several months anyway, I've been conducting a Bible class at the nursing home on Wednesdays at 2.30. Not one time did Mr. Avery ever come to Bible class. I invited him every time, he never came. But he couldn't stay away. He'd have to wander down there and he'd stand in the doorway wearing that tan or that brown, whatever color, color jacket you want to call it, work. and he'd stand there until he realized that I'd seen him. And he'd put his hands in his pocket and off he'd go. If it was early, he might come back twice. First Sunday singing, Mr. Avery, you going to come down and singing? Nope. Never did. But he couldn't stay away. He'd be about two songs in, you look in the doorway, there's Mr. Avery standing there with his brown jacket in his hands in his pockets, usually wearing his, his Terminator sunglasses, and he'd stand there until he realized that I'd seen him, and then he turned and he'd go the other way. Every day on Wednesday when I'd come for Bible class, I'd say, Mr. Avery, you gonna watch my TV show tomorrow? Nope. I said, well, you watch Bobby, don't you? He watches Bozo shows. See? Said, you watch Bobby, don't you? Yep. Well, so I'm right on, I'm on right after Bobby. Said, yeah, all you gotta do is just stay seated and you can see me right after Bobby. Said, I'll turn you off, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> I say, well, Bobby. I said, Mr. Avery, I said, you ought not you ought not be that way. I said, I said, of all the nice things I've done for you, and said you do that, and he'd walk down, I get nah. <laughs> <laughs> off you go. Same thing every week every week. I'm going to miss that. My first encounter with Mr. Avery was a game of checkers on the desk at the <laughs> nurse's station there at the front. He hadn't been there but a day or two and we played checkers. And if you knew Mr. Avery, you just played Mr. Avery's way. He always won. <laughs> Red, black didn't make any difference. Squares. He'd jump you six, seven times. He'd wipe out half your checkers on the first. He'd be, he usually went about three moves. <laughs> he'd have all your checkers jumped, and then he was, it was over. And I always threatened I was going to whoop him in checkers, and he never did play me ever again. And that's how our relationship really got started. The best one Mr. Avery ever got over on me was week before last. I come to nursing home every Monday, usually sometimes on Tuesday, about every Wednesday, sometimes on Thursday, Friday. I mean, it just, I mean, I just seem like I, they ought to get me a badge so I, so I can get in. But I'm walking, I pull in, and, and I know Rhonda Elliott can always see my truck when I'm pulling in, and so I know she knows I'm there, she's not asleep. And I didn't know it, but Mr. Avery had seen me turn in, and he knows my truck. And so I get out. Not knowing a thing, I get out, I walk up, I walk up the stairs to the door, and there's about eight nursing students and a nursing student instructor and three or four nursing home staff members all standing there at the desk, and they're all looking at the door. I have no idea. So I walk up, and I, of course, I didn't have to 
hit the button. Everybody knew I was there, so they buzzed me in. I walk in, and everybody just busts out laughing. Busts out laughing. So I'm like, all right, what's going on? Walk up there, and I said, why are y'all looking and laughing when I walk in the door? They said, Mr. Avery just walked through. And without stopping, he said, y'all don't let that convict in. <laughs> of course, y'all know the prison's right across the, the road. And so they were actually looking, expecting to see a guy in, a white, in some white clothes standing at the door. And it was me. <coughs> and if you look closely, you can see the tire tracks on that bus he threw me under. <laughs> gonna be a lot easier to get rid of boxes <laughs> I never seen a man love empty boxes as much as Mr. Avery last week right last week I was coming out of the activities room and there was a pallet full of boxes and Mr. Avery had he had one in each hand he had them under his arm and Mr. Avery you can't take those to your room your room's already filled to the ceiling with boxes there ain't no room to put these boxes so I had an idea. I said, Mr. Avery said, you'll put these boxes back and just bring this one out for me. I said, I'll put your Christmas present in it. That was good enough. He said, go put it in my chair. I put it in his chair right there next to Dare's door. And, and I took that box home and I put his Christmas present in it. And uh, he knew what it was. Because Mr. Avery was a big believer in Santa Claus. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to put your Christmas present in. I came back on Monday of this week, had his Christmas presents. I said, Mr. Avery, I said, Santa Claus came by my house and he left a present for you. I said, there's two presents here. The one in the box is from Santa Claus and the small one is from me. He said, I know what's in the big one. I said, what is it? He said, straw hat like Coach Saban wears. I said, you asked Santa Claus for that, didn't you? He said, yep. I said, what do you think's in the small small package? He said, poster, Coach Saban. There's what was in the box. And there's what was in the other package. I made him promise not to open his presents till Christmas. When I left that day, there wasn't one nurse or staff member in that nursing home that ever thought those presents would make it to Christmas. Most of them said they'll have them open before the sun goes down. I was back in the nursing home on Tuesday, and those presents were still sitting in his room unopened. I was in the nursing home on Wednesday, and those presents were still there unopened. I got the call yesterday that Mr. Avery had a stroke. I didn't know where he was. I went to the nursing home. I ran by his room on my way to the emergency room. His presents were still there, unopened. The nurses tell you that even in the state that he's in, that he can still hear you. I hope they're right. Because about 2 o'clock, 2.30 yesterday, I went back to the nursing home for the second time. Well, actually, I went 12.30, but at 2.30, I went in, and we opened his presents. I said, Mr. Avery, you were right. The big box had your hat in it, and the little box had your Nick Saban poster. And I said, I'm going to put it right here in your, in your window so you can see it. If you open your eyes, you can see it. I'm going to put your hat down here at the foot of your bed. I said, you, when you open your eyes, you can see the hat that Santa brought you. But he never did. But I hope he knows. You know, I have to talk a little bit about the Bible. That's kind of like my duty. People talk about folks either being saved or lost. But there's one condition that a man can be in that is neither saved nor lost. And that is the state of safe, the state of safe, and that's the state that a man starts in, from the time he's conceived, the time that he's born as a child, he is in a state of safety, 
Only when he's old enough to know the word of God and the will of God and to break the will of God and he sins, then he's lost. He'll never be safe again. Not in that sense. But he can be saved. Mr. Avery was never lost. Never having been lost, he never needed to be saved. Be safe. The Bible teaches us that little children are as safe as anybody on the planet. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, verse 14. Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, verse 3. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. Sin is a transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Little children have no capacity to break the will of God. And we all know that Mr. Avery entered this world and left it with the mind of a child. Brother Ross and I were just talking about that right as I got here this afternoon. What a blessing it would be to know, to live life, and for us to know that he had never lived a day of his life outside of a relationship and a bond with the Lord. And I thought about this as well, that I know a lot of people believe that when folks die, they go straight to heaven. I don't believe that. I don't believe the Bible teaches it. I believe Luke 16, 19 to 31 teaches us that those that are saved, when they die, they go to a place that's called paradise. In Luke 16, 19 to 31, it's called Abraham's bosom. It's where Lazarus went. And it's where all the souls of the faithful, all those that are saved or safe, go to await the judgment. Revelation 6, 9 to 11 teaches us that, that there were those at that time who were awaiting God's vengeance on those that were evil. They weren't in heaven, they were waiting. And there's a waiting place for those that are saved and safe. And Mr. Avery, I believe, is in that place. And by every measure, everything that I've heard, I believe he's finally been reunited with his mother. I didn't know anything about his mother until the events of this week. They tell me that she was a good Christian woman. And I just think, what a blessing it would be to see her boy for the first time with all of his faculties. And yet also with all of his memories. The Bible teaches us we carry our identity and our memories into, into eternity with us. Abraham said to the rich man, son, remember, remember. To have all of his memories of his loving mother. And then to have all the faculties to tell her for the first time how much he really loved her. And Mr. Avery really couldn't tell you that he loved you. I think his way of showing his love was to pick at you. I'm going to throw you under the jail. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. I'm going to throw you under the jail. Every time I think about that statement, here's what I hear. I love you, but I just don't know how to say it. All of you heard it. Going to get your legs striped. Going to go under the jail. Throw you in a slammer. All the, all the statements that we loved and, and got used to hearing from Mr. Avery, we're going to miss them. We're going to miss them. I'm going to miss them. I'm going to say one more thing and I'm going to quit. I'm glad my grandpa used to carry me to the nursing home in Dexter, Missouri when I was a boy. I've never been afraid to go to the nursing home. A lot of people are. A lot of people can't go. Boy, they don't know what they're missing. I carried my children to the nursing home from a young age. I can only imagine the people that would come in time after time and just see Mr. Avery sitting there. And in their mind, in their mind, all they think, well, there's just another crazy old man that ain't got nobody to take care of. 
But they didn't really see Mr. Avery. Walt Bettinger was the CEO for Charles Schwab, and he shared this story one time of his college days. He said, I was a senior in college. He said, I'd made all A's. It was my last final in a business class. I'd studied all the formulas, all the, all the math. He said, I walked in as ready as I knew how to be for my final exam, or so I thought. The instructor handed out our exam, face down, and said, turn it over, you can begin. So we turned our sheets over and it was blank. The professor said, for the last however many weeks, I've taught you everything I know to teach you about business and finance. He says, but your work is more than business and finance, it's about people. Your final exam is to tell me the name of the lady that cleans this building. He said, it's the only exam I ever failed in college, and rightfully so. He said, I saw her every day. I knew about how old she was. I could describe her. I, 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 I could tell you about her. He said, I didn't know her name. It was Dorothy. And I think by all the people that walked by Mr. Avery day after day, saw him time after time, but they didn't see him. And boy, what did they miss? What did they miss? We need to learn to see people. Because if we don't, we might miss the next Mr. Avery. Let's pray together and we'll be finished. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the privilege of knowing Mr. Avery, for sharing in his life. Father, we're thankful for his influence in our lives, the way that he's touched the lives of so many, especially those that, that work at the nursing home day after day. Father, we are thankful again for the hope that we have because of the provisions that have been made through you and through your son. We're thankful for the reunion that we trust has been a joyous one in the last 20 or so hours with his reunion with his precious mother. Father, we pray that you'll help us to see people as we travel the various pathways of this life. Father, help us to see people as you see them, as souls made in your image, Father, worthy of our, our consideration, worthy of our attention, Father, worthy of friendship. And Father, even more than that, help us to see ourselves as you see us, in need of a Savior, and Father, as in need of guidance, in need of help and strength. And in this hour, as we grieve over the loss of this loved one, Father, we know we need you even more now than we did a day ago. And we pray and we trust that you will comfort us and strengthen us, Father, that you will lighten our countenance with the thoughts and the precious memories of Mr. Avery and the thoughts of his reunion with his mother. And Father, we're just so grateful for that hope that we have. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Test our friends, if you would, to rise, please.
thank everybody for being here today. I wish the building could have been full. Mr. Avery deserved it. But thank you all for being here. Our service for today is now brought to a close. There will be no graveside service. He'll be buried at, in Memorial Gardens uh, next to his mother. Again, thank you for being here. And at this time, you are dismissed.